I wonder if Brother Marcellus, would you lead us in an opening prayer as we go into our study? Hey, um, our Father in heaven, oh, what a privilege um, to call you our Father. Yes. Thank you for your great sacrifice that um, we can be called children of God. Thank you. As we come together tonight to study your word, to sanctify us, that word can sanctify us. Yes. We invite your Holy Spirit to be with uh, each and every one of us and uh, to open our mind to understand uh, what we're going to study and be especially with uh, and there you go as he conduct the uh, meeting tonight. But uh, we want to uh, uh, to pray to lift up before you um, uh, Colleen has she grieved uh, her husband and uh, if uh, for ourselves we feel we can um feel the what's going on but uh we know that uh, uh as human uh, we we feel that uh, he's hurt but uh you know the feeling and you can uh, uh be there for her yes and uh, we pray for the timothys as miss carmen going down the hill but uh, you know you are there with them. Please comfort uh, um, Brother Timothy as uh, he's seen uh, his wife going uh, this way. Mm. We pray for for the carries as uh, they travel for graduation, uh, be with them. And uh, we pray for the uh, continue uh, the coming Haiti, what's going on, and throughout the world. The world is mm. upside down. But uh, keep uh, help us to keep our faith uh, strong in you as we see what's going on around us. Yes. Uh, we continue to pray for um, others as they travel for for treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that you are the great healer that can heal. Mm -hmm. Believe them uh, where they at, and now uh, we pray for. Also for um, for Angela, Sister Angela, wisdom. We ask that uh, you continue with be with her, and uh, we pray for the youth, um, and we pray for the church, uh, our church, and for each family, and uh, especially for the youth uh, as um, we all need your presence, uh, your Holy Spirit uh, to be with them and to be with us. And uh, we pray for our new pastor and uh, we pray for the leadership of the, the church. May your name be glorified. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Brother Renoir. Um, we are more than two or three, so we know that the angels are here with us as we apply our minds to the study of God's word. Uh, I wonder if we could turn to page 687, 687 in Desire of Ages. Um... Last week, uh, Mac took us through the scene of Jesus Christ on the Mount of Olives, I believe, yeah, and then into Gethsemane, the prayers there. 
I just thought it would be good if you could pick up towards the end of Gethsemane experience. What was going on in Gethsemane? And I, and I thought if you could begin at the top of page 687. Uh, begin in the middle of a sentence, really. Begins now at the bottom of page 686 and then the tempter at the top of page 687. And please uh, read the paragraph there for me, rest of the paragraph for me, please. Welcome, Connie. Appreciate you. Thank you. Betty, would you care to read that for us, please? Sure. Beginning where, Hugo? I, I see the bottom of page. Where do you want me to start at the bottom of page 686? No. Okay, the one word. <laughs> one word. <laughs> okay, and up, up up, until when? Just the, the next end of the paragraph. End, okay. end of the paragraph. Okay. Now the tempter had come for the last fearful struggle. For this he had been preparing during the three years of Christ's ministry. Everything was at stake with him. If he failed here, his hope of mastery was lost. The kingdoms of the world would finally become Christ's. He himself would be overthrown and cast out. But if Christ could be overcome, the earth would become Satan's kingdom and the human race would be forever in his power. With the issues of the conflict before him, Christ's soul was filled with dread of separation from God. Satan told him that if he became the surety for a sinful world, the separation would be eternal. He mm. would be identified with Satan's kingdom and would never more be one with God. Wow. That's a wow. frightful thought. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Awful, Ooh. awful. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Top of the page, it says the last fearful struggle. The last fearful struggle. Would it be Satan's kingdom or would it be Christ's kingdom? Mm. Mm. That is a big question. Oh, yes, the thing that he not... had been planning. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say this. He had been preparing during the three years of Christ's ministry for this for this time. Imagine yes. that. And so had Jesus mm -hmm. started in the in the wilderness, I'm sure. Mm. But thank the Lord um Jesus Christ came through victorious. Mm. Now in chapter twenty two. And verse 47 to 53, uh, I came across three key thoughts. And we'll see it as we read through it. And I don't know if um, maybe Pastor Lou, if you would read it. I'm looking for a kiss, a sword, and a reign of darkness. A kiss, a sword, and a reign of darkness. Three key thoughts. I wonder if you would read for me, please, beginning in verse 47 through 53. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus, when Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck a servant, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the, to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders, who, who, had come for, who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? 
and you have come with uh, every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. A kiss, sword, and a reign of darkness. Mm. Um, there, there are, I noticed that there were three questions too. Did you see them? Judas? Three questions? Yeah, Judas, are you betraying the Son of mm -hmm. Man with a kiss? Mm. And then Jesus' followers said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Mm. And then Jesus said, am I leading a rebellion? Mm. Just thought that these we might keep in mind as we look again at the at the kiss. Maybe you have some thoughts about that scenario. Uh, Luke calls him the man who was called Judas. Uh, <laughs> up to up to this time, I think uh, the gospel writers had called all of the 12 disciples. But now Luke writes the man who was called Judas. He didn't even want to call him a disciple. Oh, I, I think he was. <laughs> That's true. That was, too, that was too honorable. That was too honorable. <laughs> yeah. Wow, and, that's true. But uh, well, of course, Let's, let's, why was it dishonorable for him at this point? He, he was, was leading, he, he was, was leading the crowd yeah. to come for Jesus. And uh, he didn't just point Jesus out. He seemed to display an affectionate approach. Mm. And this is this is so subtle. Yeah. One would think that Judas was Jesus' best friend. As he approached him to kiss him. But it was all a deception. So on the one side, we see a crowd coming up with Judas. And then verse 49. Well, no, let's, uh, let's look at another, at the... Uh, I, I, that's second paragraph on page 687. The paragraph of page 687, beginning, and what was? What was to be gained by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Shirley, are you there? No. Did you, you what question what question did you ask? Do you have your desire of ages? Yes. Do you read for us page 687? That paragraph beginning, and what was to be gained by the sacrifice? Mm -hmm. And what was to be gained by this sacrifice? How hopeless appeared the guilt and ingratitude of men. In its hardest features, Satan pressed the situation upon the Redeemer. The people who claim to be above all others in temporal and spiritual advantages have rejected you. They are seeking to destroy you. 
seeking to destroy you, the foundation, the center and seal of the promises made to them as a peculiar people. One of your own disciples who has listened to your instruction and has been among the foremost in church activities will betray you. Should I go on? Yes, please. One of your most zealous followers will deny you. All will forsake you. Christ's whole being aboard the thought that those whom he had undertaken to save, those whom he loved so much, should unite in the plots of Satan. This pierced his soul. This conflict was terrible. Its measure was the guilt of his nation, of his accusers and betrayer, the guilt of a world lying in wickedness. The sins of men weighed heavily upon Christ, and the sense of God's wrath against the sin was crushing out his life. Wow. Pastor Lou, please comment on this for me, please. I heard you. That's just, to me, that's just so, 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 uh, I don't know, it's hard to put into words. The sense, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. sense of God's wrath against sin was crushing out his life. That's, uh, to me, that's such a... Well, mm -hmm. Mm. It's hard to, we cannot comprehend mm -hmm. the, what was going through Jesus' mind and his heart and his whole body, how he was reacting to all of this. You know, it's just. Uh, mm. Do you remember that second sentence? It says, How hopeless appeared the guilt. And in gratitude, man. Yes. That is a very troubling thought. Was his sacrifice going to be worth it when men were so ungrateful? Yeah. And, um, and and later on. One, Satan presents to Jesus the examples of the ingratitude of men. And he began with the thought, one of your own disciples was listened to your instruction and has been among the foremost in church activities will betray you. Of course, back in early Adventist history, Adventism experienced that, that there were prominent leaders in the church who, after a while, branched off and uh, started their own movement or whatever it was, and sometimes betrayed the church. But... Uh, in Jesus' case, Ellen White uh, is, is mindful of Judas, his own disciple, who was with him in person, ministering in church activities. Satan feeds this thought in Jesus' mind, he will betray you. And this is what is crushing out Jesus' life. That he was doing so much for mankind, and mankind were not appreciating it. Anyone, any, any additional thought on that? It's the same, uh, or, or, or sometimes you feel that you've done so much for, say, for example, your children and, uh, and others, and sometimes ingratitude is one of the things that appear in their behavior. And this can hurt, you know, on a human level. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Mm. Yes. 
Yeah. Um, so I'm glad actually, to see you, Chris. Shirley, I was Shirley, I was actually thinking the same thing. I'm going to say that that you know, <laughs> if you've done something, a project at work, and done, you felt like you did a good job, or you made a good meal at home, or you did something at church, and nobody says a thing, and yes, how much yes. that can hurt, and yet. Jesus is the savior of the world. And you're right. I, I was thinking that very same thing, mm -hmm. that how ungrateful that humans can be, but that must have hurt the son of God. I, we yeah. have a book by a dear friend, Kim Johnson, called The Cross. And he goes through all the different um, types of abuse that Jesus suffered. And that would be in another chapter, but... It's emotional and verbal and physical and mental and all kinds. And we just can't comprehend any of that. Mm -hmm. Does it drive the point home when that betrayal is with a kiss? No. No. Paul talks about greet one another with the holy kiss. Mm. Here, yeah, Judas is greeting Jesus with what appears to be a holy kiss, but it is really a kiss of betrayal. Mm. All right, then, well, not sleep. let us not linger on too much there. I'm looking at verse. 49. We're living in a time in which churches, church buildings, synagogues, and other such um, edifices are defaced, de destroyed, attacked. Sometimes congregants are assaulted. Should we strike with the sword? Teachers well, are being armed in school. Well, in this case, obviously, Jesus did not approve because he made the comment and then restored the ear. I find it interesting that Luke doesn't say that it was Peter. Not Luke, no. John, John, uh, uh, Apostle John, he's the only one who makes that reference, that it was Peter. No. Interesting. So, so I, I think you'll agree with me that the kiss was a negative symbol. Would the sword also be a negative symbol based on what we read in that brief narrative there? Jesus said, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Is that... Does that um, <laughs> fit in anywhere? He said it, yes. He, um, no, not in this narrative, but in, in this another. conversation, no. Yeah, but it just says no more of this. What do but you mean? Asking, like, is there ever a time when it is appropriate to bear arms, right? Is that what you're asking? Well, that, that's what I'm really asking. Well, maybe it's okay to bear arms, but uh, at the time that Jesus is referring to, it was not appropriate mm. because his kingdom was not of this world. Well, I didn't think that we ever felt that bearing arms was appropriate, at least the Christian perspective. I mean, judges is full of bearing arms. <laughs> I mean, the whole right. Old Testament is full of bearing arms. Um, but I thought in, in our understanding today that that was really not, that's Jesus, that was not an example of what Jesus would approve. He didn't bear arms and he told his disciples not to. Um, I, I was interesting, interested in your comment of, about the kiss being a negative gesture. I, I didn't understand that. What do you, what did you mean by that? And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little late. 
We're glad you're here. Mm -hmm. yes. Because it was a kiss of betrayal, not a kiss of affection. Yeah. But the the fact a kiss is not supposed to be a negative gesture, it's supposed to be a a, a gesture of approval and, and, and loving. Exactly. And so it was a contradiction of exactly. what a kiss means. Yeah. Okay, that's what you that's where you're going. It was a kiss of betrayal. Um, beware when people are anxious to hug you and <laughs> the affection <laughs> towards you. Yeah. yeah. And then oh, they come to this. I'm sorry. Um, I can't. I don't know. I don't have the actual text, but I think that. Jesus told his disciples to sell their cloak and buy a sword. Yes, that was, that? Yeah, that was earlier. Okay. Uh, probably in Before Matthew. The yes. I think Peter, Peter asked, shall I at this time um, get a sword? Uh, since verse 36, uh, verse 36, is it? No, that's not it. Uh, uh, he who has no sword, let, verse him 38, sell 38. let him sell his garment. Yes, verse 36. He who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Yeah, and then verse 38 says that the disciples said, See, Lord, there are two swords. And uh, Jesus replies, That is enough. So, <laughs> would someone please interpret what that sentence means? That is enough. <laughs> You know, I struggle with that. I, the commentary oh, seems that's to enough. Suggest... Shut up, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Is it two swords is enough? Or my violence? comment uh, oh sorry, were you done with, with your no, comment? No, no. Um it, my my comments in the Bible that I have, the Andrews study Bible for twenty two thirty eight says enough. Jesus neither affirms nor argues against the disciples' possession of two swords. Jesus followers well. face difficult times for which they must be prepared, and Jesus speaks strongly to warn them. Though he has previously counseled peace in place of violence, his disciples who have been waiting impatiently to fight for the kingdom take him literally. <laughs> yeah. Jesus did not go along with the thought that uh, his kingdom needed the defense of a sword. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, we, we have two opinions here. Uh, as a church, as a denomination, we do not advocate bearing arms in, uh, in war. Um, I don't know if that principle applies, you know, if you walk home late at night, <laughs> whether or not you should carry protection, or in this present day in which we live, as I said earlier, that uh, buildings are being uh, um, stormed and the pastors have been attacked in churches. Yes. Killed. That's why um, Jesus needs to come because this stuff, this stuff is too like complicated <laughs> and too complicated. Yeah, that's true. One teenager uh, approached a, a minister in church just a couple of weeks ago, and if it wasn't for the fact that the the, uh, the what do you call it, the trigger is it or whatever or the lock lock, lock that that uh, minister would have been shot. Mm. And the same uh, in, in another, I think it was an Anglo uh, Episcopalian church, in which uh, another 16-year-old or 14-year-old outside of the church, outside of the view of the cameras, uh, was planning on attacking members within the church. Uh -oh. oh, yes. That was also just two weeks ago. So we are living in an age in which 
respect for God gone out the window. Um, church properties no longer regarded as being sacred to a, to, uh, to a lesser degree, perhaps, but uh, certainly it's it's a growing concern. I mean, mm. not too long, well, some years ago when someone could come in and sit with you in your prayer meeting and at the end of prayer meeting take out his gun and shoot nine kill nine congregants yeah. in church on prayer meeting night. Yeah. Uh, this is real. This is not you know, storybook. It's, you know, it's, it, it's interesting you mentioned that, Hugo, because just last night, Kristen, you were there last night at the board meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. Carl, I mean, uh, brother, um, what's his name? Richard. Richard Carr. Richard Carr, yeah. He he gave a report because he's he's one of the uh, uh, security. security. He's one of the security persons for the church. And boy, he was pleading his heart out how we need to be so, so careful in, in church. Because, you know, like you say, somebody can walk into that church on a Sabbath morning and, and uh, have a heyday. So he has to, um, anyways, he was quite emphatic about how we need to be very careful about, you know, who we let into the church. You remember anything about that, uh, Tristan, at all? Yeah, he, he said that he's going to put together a, a policy and that we can do like a, a fire drill and an active shooter drill as well. And he's yeah. going to write that up and and so that we know exactly what we're supposed to do in the event of an active shooter or fire. Yeah. Christian, you said so rightly, Jesus needs to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we can't figure all this stuff out. And it's, too, it's getting too complicated. It's just getting hard. Yes. Um, a segue into verse 53. We read the passage earlier, but now verse 53 says, Every day I was with you in the temple. Well, Hello? it begins. Hello? Verse, verse 52, sorry. in fact, says, Am I leading a rebellion? Yeah. Um, Give me a call what do you make of that statement, that question? Well, One of the three questions. Call me back. Verse You're saying verse 53? Uh, when I was uh, with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour in the power of darkness? Yeah. Let, let, we're going to come to that just now, but let's just deal with the question that Jesus asked. Am I leading a rebellion? Which, uh, what verse is that? What verse is that? Uh, 52. Okay, oh. then have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? Okay. A robber. Oh, I see in my version, it, it says, am I leading a rebellion? Hmm. I think historically many had led rebellions. Um, and Jesus might have been identified with those who had led rebellions that had come to naught. Is this another rebellion that was coming to naught? And if it was a rebellion, then they would, they could consider themselves justified in uh, attacking him. Yes. So exactly. any any excuse to be able to condemn him and to treat him as a robber uh, gave them, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Made them feel justified in what they were doing. They they had to cover themselves up. Um, so it was important that Jesus identified the fact that um, he was every day in the temple. He did nothing rebellious. He was just simply teaching people. Some might feel that he was advocating uh, radical radicalism. <laughs> um, is it is it better to be uh, to teach itching ears or? Be radical in nature. Well, what's the difference? Oh, itching ears would be like um, just giving people what they want to hear. To hear. Yeah. Okay. 
It's neither is good. Neither is good. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> true. At this at this particular time in history, there were zealots. Yes. And and even one of the disciples was a reformed zealot, I guess. Well, that's, that's right. And and I think that the the authorities probably felt they had the right to take somebody forcibly if if they were um, singled out as being a zealot. And so they they saw they saw no problem in in arresting Jesus the way they did. Um, I guess we would we would probably feel the same way too if we had been, if the tables had been turned. Thank you for that comment. Uh, and now we come to your point, um, Mike. This is your hour when darkness reigns. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone prepared to elaborate a little bit on what that might mean? When darkness Rains. Well, you know, it's it's obvious that Jesus knew what they were up to. He knew what their motives were, and so their behavior uh, fits with what he's been trying to teach the people all along. That that, that they had the wrong motives. They 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 weren't trying to uh, show love to people. They weren't trying to, to help people. They were trying to protect the power of their position. And he was a threat to that. And so their hour is to seize him so that they can remove the threat to their authority. It had to, nothing to do with the love of God. So, so in other words, if there are two spirits in the world, Jesus is driven by one spirit, the spirit of God. The other spirit is obviously the spirit of Satan. Mm -hmm. And that's who is working with. Darkness. Darkness. That's who was working with the religious leaders. Satan was working with them. Let's, let's be open and honest. Uh, this, this is your hour. When darkness reigns which means that darkness had complete control over them. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an off. If, if we would, uh, I wonder if we could just read through the rest of the chapter back, just to see the nature of the darkness. Mm -hmm. um, we could probably have three people read. Can someone please read verse 54 to 62 or 54 to 57? All right. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled the fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them and a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him, but he denied him, saying, woman, I do not know him. I think that's an indication of darkness. <laughs> you know, not from the leader, religious leadership, but from a disciple. Peter, I, I think, was more intent on preserving his neck rather yeah. than, rather than um, giving support to his... And yet he had boasted that he would die oh. with the king, you know. It's when, Be careful when, the, brother, boast. when the rubber meets the road, That's he's it. out of there. <laughs> That's it. Let's have a look at uh, verse 63 and 65. Uh, probably Mac, maybe if you could read that one first, please. Verse 63? Verse 65. Um, yes. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him, and having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they, blasph they blasphemously spoke against him. 
The NIV, if someone has the NIV there. Uh, yeah, that was the New King James. It said many other insulting things to him. It's the Son of God. Many other what things? Insulting. 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 Um, these two verses illustrate another aspect of darkness. Men guarding Jesus, the Son of God, were mocking him and beating him. That sounds like one of Jesus' parables, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And they blindfolded him and demanded the teacher prophesy. Who hit you? The Living Bible says, Now the guards in charge of Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him. Then they hit him and asked, Who hit you that time, you prophet? And they threw all sorts of terrible insults at him. Yeah. I think scoffers, then Peter says it in the last days, scoffers will ask, where is the coming? Mm. Everything continues as it was since the beginning. The scoffing is definitely a sign of a momentous mm -hmm. clash between uh, truth and error right and wrong, mm -hmm. divinity, and uh, the satanic. A rejection of the Holy Spirit. Rejection of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy, that's the word I was looking for. Blasphemy. Yeah. Let's look at uh, two more verses, three more verses, uh, verse 66 to 68. Um, I wonder if Hello, could you read that one first, please? 66 and 68. Yes. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the, if you are the Christ, they said, tell us. And Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. If I ask you, you would not answer but from now Thank on, you. the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. I'm going to res reserve that last verse for our closing thought. Mm -hmm. Because up to verse 58, all we keep seeing is the, the, the little um, evidences of the presence of darkness. Mm -hmm. It was daybreak, it says in, in the New International Version. Only daybreak in the time sense, but there was still darkness in people's minds. And these are the council of elders. And they asked after three years, if you are the Christ, tell us. And then Jesus heard accept the consequences of innocence says if i tell you you will not believe and i believe that's the reason why jesus taught so much in parables because if you told things to to men or to people in a straight uh, way they wouldn't believe or when he tells them in parables they have no excuse they can interpret it mm. appropriately and then, of course, conclusions. draw their own conclusions. He quoted Isaiah, that their minds would be blinded lest they understand and are saved. Um, unbelief was that great barrier to their accepting Jesus as the Christ. And we're, things are not very different today than they were then. Yeah. Uh, there are people who deny Jesus, might go to church, but they deny Jesus in the public. Uh, of course, the end of Peter's experience was that 
in verse 62, it says, And he went outside and wept bitterly when Jesus turned and looked at him. Now, all that, you know, people would keep looking at Jesus and seeing those eyes of his gazing on them, and that they would respond by humility and sorrow, as Peter did. Then, of course, the temple guards, those who are looking after the security of the temple, were in fact uh, the first ones to be mocking Jesus and insulting him and beating him. Uh, and then, of course, Jesus' expression there in 66 to 68, that amongst the leadership, the teachers of the law, Jesus said that there was unbelief. Uh, these were learned people, graduates, PhDs, but who were unbelievers. And uh, that is a rather sobering thought. Yeah, this is the church. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. So if we could close on that verse 69. Um, 69. Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Yes. That's a, that's a great hope we have, isn't it? Yes. From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God, it says in Revelation. Well, um, it's a very um, sobering study. It says later on that when Jesus had been taken, arrested in the garden, that Peter was the one who suggested that everyone should run for their lives in order to save themselves. But... Um, May the Lord help us, yes. whatever the consequences may be and appear to be, that we will remain faithful to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Renoir, um, I think, covered most of our prayer requests. Um, we need to continue to remember Danilo. Can I ask, obviously, um, Brother Pastor Lou, uh, we switched our prayer emphasis round a little bit, so we're just going to close off with a benediction this time. Thank you. And uh, ask for God's continued blessing. Precious Father, we... I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, Kristen. Sorry, um... Also pray that the Lord will send volunteers for the Good Neighbor Place. Oh, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Gracious Lord, we just want to thank you for your presence with us here this evening. Yeah, we thank you, Father, for the passage of scripture that you've given us tonight to ponder. And we just want to, again, leave those names that we brought to you before Leave them before you and remember you remember all of their needs. We now we also remember that Kristen mentioned that there's a need at the good neighbor place for volunteers. We ask Lord that you would impress upon those who are who may be able to help, that you would impress upon them to uh, uh, volunteer for that so that we can the good neighbor place can continue to to flourish. Thank you again for this study tonight. We commit ourselves to you. This is a Wednesday. We look forward to the Sabbath, and we pray that you would keep us to then, so we can, when we come together again as a as a people, to worship you. And we thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you, Hugo. thank you, Hugo. Thank you, thank you, thank you Hugo. Hugo. Good to meet with you this evening. Thank you for watching the Serendipity Bible Study Group of the Apopka Seventh-day Adventist Church. We meet live on Zoom every Wednesday 
at 7 p.m. Eastern Time for one hour. We invite you to join us on Zoom whenever you can. Just click the link in the description of this video and feel free to leave us a comment or a prayer request. If you can't join us live, you can always watch like you are now. Thank you.